So, explosive training, which is something that I like to ridicule a lot because it doesn't exist. It's kind of like a lot of the uh, political ideologies that are popular now that don't actually exist. They're just a figment of many people's imagination. And explosive training is one thing that is advocated and taught by many, many, many personal trainers, many coaches. And the reality of it, it is, is that it is simply full. It does not actually exist. It's an idea that many trainers and coaches want to be true. Because if you didn't know any better, you would think it might be. But it is an illusion. Okay. And most trainers believe explosive training is a real thing. Because of where they are taught their exercise information. So today, I'm going to show you why most personal trainers believe in things that don't actually exist, that don't have any actual evidence or support behind them, including things like explosive training. And not a lot, not a lot of people know this. Um, it's a huge problem. There's, there's only a handful of people who know where the personal training the exercise science curriculum comes from. And what it comes from is something called the American College of Sports Medicine, okay, the ACSM, also the NSCA. If you are a um, strength and conditioning coach, you know strength and conditioning coaches, or you've had them in the past, where they get their certification and their education is from the NSCA in a combination of Education from the ACSN. Here's the problem. Most of the recommendations and position stands by the ACSN are not supported by any evidence. Okay. This is the problem. So we've got people who, who get their personal training certifications, go to college for four years if they're stupid, eight years if they're an absolute imbecile for exercise. Because here's the thing, <laughs> on the sidetrack, why is it a stupid idea to go to college to learn exercise science? First of all, everything you're going to be taught is based on ACSM curriculum and it's wrong. And I'm gonna get into that in a second. Number two, what kind of job do you qualify for after spending thousands and thousands of dollars on an exercise science um, degree, you know, I was I, I I was introduced this ad: get your BS in exercise science online, and then they listed the jobs that you could get with a BS in exercise science. The first one was certified personal trainer, then group exercise instructor. Then personal trainer, then exercise instructor, like it was the same fucking job, <laughs> just with different names. Basically, if you spend four years on an exercise science degree, what you're going to qualify for is a personal trainer, which you could get a certification in about two weeks. So terrible, terrible idea. But here's the thing. The people who go to college for four years, six years, or eight years to learn exercise science become the authority on the subject without realizing most of what they were taught is wrong. Okay, how do I know this? How do I know that most of what they were taught is wrong? Because you would think that like, it just kind of supports my argument, but I actually have evidence that most of what they were taught is wrong. Because three exercise scientists closely examined ACSN recommendations and position stands and studied the evidence, or lack thereof, that the ACSM provided for their position stands. The ACSM says this when it comes to training for power. The ACSM says this when it comes to training for muscle growth. This when it comes to training for agility. 
So these three exercise scientists back in 2004 were like, huh, this doesn't really make any sense. So they started examining the position stands of the ACSM, examining the evidence provided for these position stands, which in many cases there was no evidence. It was just an opinion. You realize that all the evidence provided either didn't even support their position stand or one out of like 15 of the studies they provided supported their position stand. You'll see this commonly in exercise. Um, you know, a lot of uh, papers, a, a lot of papers by Brad Schoenfeld actually, will say one thing in the conclusion, like multiple sets are better for muscle growth. But then you look at the studies that he provided, and maybe two out of 15 support that multiple sets are better for muscle growth. And 13 out of 15 do not. So institutions have a way of kind of twisting the data to support what they've upheld for a long time, even though data goes against it. So, um, but a couple of exercises back in 2004 called them on their bullshit and they examined it deeply. Okay. And this is the problem with institutions. If you have an institution that says something, Anyone goes against the grain of what they say, they just get boom, smash and ridicule. Well, I have a master's and I have a PhD. Dude, you work at fucking Crunch Fitness. I don't give a shit what you got. You're wrong. So here's a study that they showed. Or here's, here's the study. And you guys, if you're a trainer, read this. Read this 10 times if you have to. They go into every common fitness belief. And they look at the evidence that the institution provides for their beliefs, for the recommendations, and they tear them apart with logic and reasoning. So this is the name of the paper. I've gone on this over this couple times before, but I want to show it again for new subscribers. Ralph Carpinelli, Robert Otto. The paper is called A Critical Analysis of the ACSM Position Stand on Resistance Training. Insufficient evidence to support recommended, recommended training protocols. So this was done in June 2004 in the Journal of Exercise Physiology. So here's a brief overview of it. In February 2002, the American College of Sports Medicine learned that they're largely responsible for a lot of the curriculum for these education exercises. Um, so they uh, published a position stand entitled Posi uh, Progression Models and Resistance Training for Healthy Adults. All right. So they claim that the program manipulation of resistance, resistance training protocols, such as the training modality, repetition duration, range of repetition, sets, frequency, blah, 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 will differentially affect specific physiological adaptations, such as muscular strength, hypertrophy, power, and endurance. So this is where this silly belief comes from, that people think you need to train differently for different physiological adaptations. You know, you want to do more sets and more repetitions for endurance. You want to do heavier weight and lower repetitions for power and strength. Bullshit. All complete bullshit that the ACSN came up with, which you know, these guys up here just completely debunked. So they also say, and this is another question I get, we'll get to in a second. They also assert that for progression in healthy adults, the programs for intermediate, advanced, and elite trainees must be different from those prescribed for novices. And a lot of times I get the question, is the golden era system good for a beginner? And this is why people believe that there's a difference in a training approach from an elite athlete to a beginner. The training approach is exactly the same. It is based on human physiology. The reason people think that there's a difference is because of these complete morons that came up with this nonsense with no evidence behind it. So let's look at the one. So here, here you'll see down here they have a table of contents on all the kind of position stands like free weights and machines. People believe that there's a difference between free weights and machines. Do you want to know why? Then. Turns out there isn't. 
repetition duration, range of repetitions, multiple sets, uh, frequency of training, periodization, training volume, power, muscle hypertrophy, these kinds of things. So, you know, a lot of you guys are kind of interested in muscle hypertrophy. So, you do the same. Yeah, these are the same institution. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you gotta be, you gotta be weird. Um, quick question: How would you recommend working out for BJJ? Why don't you go uh, look at my uh, interview with Steve Maxwell? He's the expert on this, and he would be a great one. Uh, just type in Steve Maxwell Jiu-Jitsu, whatever. So let's look at you know everybody's interested in muscle growth, right? So let's look at their position stand. The common position stand that most people are taught when it comes to muscle growth. And let's see all the holes in there because there's so many. So you guys kind of probably wonder why I recommend things that go against the grain of what is commonly believed. And because what is commonly believed is wrong. Okay, There are people out there who examine what the institutions um, recommend, who examine common beliefs, and debunk the shit out of them. They've been debunking it for years. Because if you were to look at, you know, so their position stand um, was published in 2002. If you look back at the journals, the medical journals and exercise journals from the early 90s to the mid 90s, they would all support high intensity training principles. These were just evidence based training principles. But Later in the late 90s and the, in the early 2000s, when exercise started to become institutionalized by assholes like this, they started to come up with nonsense, okay? And if their beliefs were not supported in previous journals, uh, you know, uh, Journal of Sports Medicine, Journal of Exercise Physiology, Journal of uh, Sports Medicine, uh, um, Journal of whatever, if, if, so these institutions, if their little beliefs weren't supported in a journal, they just created their own journal. And that's why you have so many stupid journals out. You can find, you can find a study that says anything. Okay, but what you gotta do is you gotta look at the journal. Because if they go to you know publish something and um, it's not gonna be accepted by a particular journal, what they'll do is just create their own journal, just to get it published. And this is what Brad Schoenfeld does, is what all these silly exercise scientists do. Um, because their nonsense is not supported by any of the previous literature. And it's not going to be peer-reviewed by the major journals. You know, they'll call it a peer-reviewed study, but who's going to review it? Well, if they created their own journal, their buddies are all going to review it, and then they call it peer-reviewed. <laughs> it's like, this is what happens. It's fucked up. Um, but let's look at... Um, It says for it, we'll look at muscle growth because a lot of you know, we'll talk about the multiple set thing. We can talk about it till fucking it's like beating the dead horse into ashes at this point. But you can do multiple sets if you want, fucking go for it. What I'm saying is, multiple sets are not going to result in any better muscle growth if the first set's done to failure. It's just, just simple as that. All right, 45. Let's see, you guys can all see this page, right? Just make sure. And uh, if you guys got questions, post questions, I'll answer them after I go over some of this stuff. But I, I really, if you guys are interested, you know, if you guys have been following my stuff, you, you pro it's probably hard not to get in debates with random people who think they know what they're talking about, but they don't. Well, if you want to get in these debates and go into these debates prepared, first of all, you're not going to change anyone's mind. Um, like Arthur Jones says, there's ignorance and there's stupidity. If you encounter someone who's ignorant, you can teach them this and they'll go, oh, okay. And it'll make sense to them because they're logical. They're just ignorant. They just don't know any better. But then you have people who are stupid. And as Arthur Jones says, stupid is genetic. You can't fix stupid. You ever hear that? You can't fix stupid? You can't. Some people just aren't, they don't have, the brain doesn't work in a way where they'll ever, ever be able to understand this. They're just going to take what other people say and use that. But if you find yourself getting in debates with people and you want to teach them actual proper exercise science, this is a good paper to be prepared for these debates. 
So let's look at their position stand on muscle hypertrophy. Position stand recommends high volume resistance training for maximal muscle hypertrophy. So where does high volume come from? Well, you know, in, it, was insti it was institutionalized by these individuals. Um, it was commonly used by bodybuilders, but institutionalized by them. So when you go with you know, your college curriculum, um, this is what they're going to teach you. They're going to teach you more volume. Why? Because the ACSM said so. But let's look at it. A study by McCall et al. is cited to show that acute resistance exercise induced increases in growth hormone concentration are highly correlated with the magnitude of muscle hypertrophy. I can already tell you this is bullshit. This is absolute insane bullshit. <laughs> McCall trained 11 males with a recreational resistance uh, training experience three times a week for 12 weeks. Subjects performed three sets of 10 repetition max uh, for each of eight free weight and machine exercises, four of which involve the elbow flexors. They were instructed to lift concentric fatigue for each set, which is failure, with one minute rest in between sets. Elbow flexion strength, 25%, biceps great, breaky elbow flexor cross-sectional area, 12.7% significantly increased. There was no significant difference in resting hormone concentrations. So this guy says the reason why higher volume makes you grow more is because a higher concentration of growth hormone. And the study actually found there was no significant increase in growth hormone, testosterone, IGF-1, pre-to-post training, except for a decrease in cortisol. All right, so McCall claimed that the decrease in resting cortisol concentration was 60.7% in the training group and control group, which comprised of eight males who did not participate <laughs> this is the training. However, the data in their table show a decrease of 22%. Resting hormone concentrations were not significantly blah, 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 blah. So part of the reason that they supported higher volume is because it's cited to show an increase in growth hormone and all the other hormones. While exercise does increase your hormones, as you, you know, there isn't, it isn't significant. Okay, so when people say exercise or increases in testosterone and stuff like that, yes, it's going to increase your testosterone. No, it's not going to do it significantly. Okay? We've known this for decades. So it's just, that's just nonsense, BS, cell point. <clears throat> um, all right, after correcting for exercise induced changes in testosterone volume, there's no significant exercise induced change in IGF 1, testosterone, or sex hormone binding globulin. There was a significant correlation, blah, 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 blah. So the one study that the ACSN provides that supports, so this is just one of the studies, that supports high volume for maximal growth is based on the premise that higher volume results in significant increases in growth hormone, which contributes to muscle growth. But when you further examine the study, there's no significant increase in the hormone. <laughs> so this is what they do all the time. They'll say something, and then they'll provide a study that supports what they say. Then you go look at the study, and the study doesn't even support what they say. And this is why you got to be careful with institutions. Like you guys all had the ability to go to PubMed, go to ResearchGate, type in um, you know single set versus multiple set, um, single joint versus multi-joint exercises. You can go do this on your own and read the research. But you've also got to pay attention to where the research is published. Okay? It can't be published in some run-of-the-mill, made-up journal. Like one guy sent me sent me a uh, research paper about core stability. He's like, well, you don't read the research, blah, 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 blah. I go, send me the research. What that supports core stability is even a thing. He sends me a study by the Saudi Arabian Institute of blah, 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 blah. Completely fucking made up journal. <laughs> At first, I'm like, oh, boy. Then I read the study. What did they do? They compared a group that did core stability exercises versus a control group that did nothing and found that the core stability group improved their core stability. Well, no shit. 
because they compared her against someone who did nothing. Now, had, had they compared the core stability group to a regular resistance training group and a control group, they would have found that traditional training and core stability, it, the core stability group did not provide any additional core stability compared to a regular resistance training group. But they didn't do the study that way because they needed to design the study in a way that supported core stability. Okay, so this is the problem. A lot of the times they don't compare their silly bullshit to regular normal resistance training because it won't support their study. Um, I'm gonna go grab my microphone. Hold on one second. <clears throat> Okay, headphones are about to die. So that's the one study. Okay, so if you guys go read through this paper, you're going to find this happens all the time. All right, so what other study did they support? So you could go on the bottom too, and what they'll show. So in this in this paper, they they create a table that shows the studies that that the ACSM provided to support their claim. And then they give an indication whether or not the study actually supported their claim. So an arrow up means studies cited in the position stand actually support the recommendation by the ACSM. Question mark. Studies cited in the position stand support the primary claim or recommendation contains serious flaws in the methodology or the data. Arrow down. Studies in the position stand fail to support the primary claim. So out of the four studies... And we can go over another one provided by the ACSM that supports higher volume for muscle growth. None of them actually support that recommendation, just like the first one we looked at. The first one we looked at said, well, you know, you want to do higher volume because it results in an increase in growth hormone, a better increase in growth hormone. And this leads to more muscle growth. Well, as we just examined the higher volume actually didn't result in a significant increase in muscle growth or growth hormone. And you'll see this happen all the time. You will see these common recommendations of exercise completely fall apart. Completely. It's kind of like, you know, it's, it's very similar to, oh, I don't want to say the word, but like a particular group of people that believe that they are something else but they're not something else. And then when you confront them with um, logical flaws in their belief, they just start to break down immediately. And that's how it is in the exercise community too. You know, these groups of people who believe that they're another type of person, but they're actually not another type of person. If you know what I mean, I'm going to avoid the whole word because I'll be shadow banned in a second, but you know, okay. <clears throat> Now let's look at another one. All right, the position stand recommends three to six sets of each exercise to increase muscle hypertrophy in advanced trainees. Okay, that's what the ACSM, the curriculum, the institution recommends. Three to six sets of each exercise for advanced trainees for muscle growth. No references are cited to substantiate. So what does the ACSM say? Okay, well, and this is what they teach in their college courses, three to six sets. Optimal muscle growth. Professor, uh, according to what? Oh, no, because I said so. That's it. Because they say so. No references are cited. No support. No evidence. Three to six sets for um, maximal muscle growth in advanced trainees. But why? Because I said so. See, because I said so doesn't count as evidence. Okay. <laughs> Contrary to this unsupported recommendation, the previously discussed study by Ostrowski is especially noteworthy because the training program encompassed the modality and protocols recommended in the position stand, and the subjects were currently weight training for four to four years. 
Subjects performed free weight exercises and followed a split routine for 10 weeks. The only difference in training variables among the three programs was the number of sets, one, two, or four sets of each exercise, with all sets performed in muscle fatigue and three minutes rest. Ostrowski concluded that the result demonstrated that low, moderate, and high volume protocols showed no difference in their effect on body mass, upper and lower body muscular strength, power, and hypertrophy. So, contrary to their stupid position stand, a study performed by Ostrowski um, analyzed groups doing a split routine two days a week, or two upper body and two lower body. One group did one set of each exercise. One group did two sets of each exercise. One group did four sets of each exercise. All to failure. What did it find? No significant difference in their effect in muscle growth, power, strength, etc. Okay, so you guys will see this happen all the time. So the reason why most trainers are wrong, the reason why most, co most coaches are wrong is because of where they learn their information. They are trusting the college. They are trusting the personal trainer certification. They're trusting the institution is providing the correct information. And the problem is they're not. Now... I would be pissed. I would be pissed if I spent six years studying exercise and everything I was taught was fucking wrong. And you can imagine why people would get upset. You know, you got Dr. Joel Seidman having someone balance on one toe with an apple on their head, juggling hand grenades and calling it a functional exercise. If I tell him he's a fucking idiot, which he is, but he's got a PhD. Well, guess what? He's got a PhD, a PhD in folklore, bullshit, nonsense, made up fuckery. So if you're to call him wrong and point out that he's wrong, what's he going to do? He's going to fight you to the death because he spent years studying something that isn't true so and this is the problem and this is why you know my my approach which isn't even my approach it's just an evidence-based approach is controversial because you've got people spending years and years and years in school learning bullshit and what are they going to do admit that they wasted thousands and thousands of dollars and their time which they're never getting back to be taught things that are that are wrong they're not going to. All right. So if you guys want to learn more about why everything most people recommend is complete fucking bullshit, is it because it comes from them? And this study debunks all of it with logic and evidence. Okay. I'll leave it up for a couple of minutes as I answer questions. <clears throat> uh, by the way, I'm going to run a sale today. If you guys want the home workout and arm program for free with the Golden Air System. Um, I'll give it away for free today. Now, be patient when you order it because it doesn't automatically go through. I have to go through manually and grant you access to the home workout and the arm program. And I do it periodically throughout the day, but I'm not sitting in my computer all day granting access for every new sale that comes in. So be patient. Give it a couple hours and a couple of times throughout the day I go through and I grant access. But you will get it. I just have to do it manually. So when you order the Golden Air system, if you find you don't have immediate access to the home workout in the arm program, it's because I haven't yet gone through and granted access. Just be patient. I will do it. You'll get it. All right. So I'm going to answer some questions here. First one, how to convince my stupid friend that trains multiple sets? Show him this. You know, show him the study, what we just went over, that the, you know, most people are traditionally taught multiple sets are better, and they're taught multiple sets are better from these people. But when you closely examine um, the evidence that they provide for their claim that multiple sets is better, it doesn't hold up. It's wrong. Morning, explosive training is myth. I'm a personal trainer, and my mind revolves around the philosophy and teaching of Mike Metzger. Well, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I wouldn't look up to Mike Metzger like he's a god. 
um, because Mike Mentzer got a lot right, but he got a lot wrong. So if you revolve and, and succumb to everything Mike Mentzer says, you're going to be wrong in some cases. Don't do that. Okay. Just because Mike Mentzer got some right, but it was 30 years ago. He got a lot wrong. All right. How many months should it take to see physical results in Golden Era? I bought Golden Era two weeks ago. Um, it depends on the individual. You know, how long does it take someone to get a suntan? How long does it take someone to grow hair? It depends on the individual. Some people are rapid responders. Some people are a little bit slower. Um, and it also depends on your diet, depends on your sleep, depends on your recovery. Not everything is the training program. There are other aspects to this too. If your diet and your sleep, um, even stress levels are not in order, it will take longer, but it should be relatively quick. If you are not seeing relatively quick results, chances are you are not training as intensely as you need to be. Okay. And that's what my coaching is for. So, you know, the golden era is a do it yourself thing. Okay. The goal is train as intensely as possible. Many people are able to train as intensely as they should be on their own. Some people are not. Some people are leaving a lot on the table. And this is why I offer the coaching program to teach you in person how to do that. Um, some people have a harder time getting to that level. Academia, government-backed experts tend to be wrong and tremendous liars. Yeah, a lot of times, too, they they have incentive to mislead. It's just the way that the world works. You know. mm, do, 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 do. Let's see. What do you think about training a rotating A-B split three times a week for some who haven't done hip for? Torso and limbs, basically a push-pull. That You can do that. It's just not going to give you better results is going to give you the exact same results as if you did a full body workout twice a week. Um, let me see if I can find the study that showed this. There was a study that compared split routine versus full body routine, and the results were exactly the same. If you're doing a three-way split, you're just going to spend one extra day in the gym for no additional results. Full body workout versus... Let's see if I can find it. Um, uh, I'm just trying to find the study, but. You know, you can try them both. Try them both. Um, if you feel like going to the gym more often, go for it. But you are never going to see a significant difference in growth. Um, neuromuscular. That has to do with neuromuscular. I'm trying, I'm trying to find the growth one. Neuromuscular. Hold on one second. We don't care about neuromuscular. We care about muscle growth. Okay, here it is. But again, it's up to you. You know, if you want to go more frequently because you like to, go for it. It's just, you know, a lot of people are so obsessed with what's going to give me the fastest results. Um, but these are the things that don't make a difference in your results. What makes a difference in your results is your diet recovery and how hard you train. Not how often, not the exercises you use, not the rep cadence, nothing. All right, so this is a study. Uh, well, this is published in 2022. They've done the study a million fucking times. Okay. Um, all right, the Journal of Sports Science Medical Rehabilitation. No between group differences were found with any variables. Both full body and split increased. Study does not show any benefits for split body resistance training program compared to full body resistance training program when it comes to muscle strength and muscle mass. Okay. So it, it's completely up to you. Um, 
I like doing a couple full body. I like doing really one full body a week. I'm at this point. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I've done split routines. I've done two full body workouts a week. I've done one full body workout a week. They're all the same. They're really all the same. All right. Where are you based? I'm based East Coast, Florida. How do you train your shins, your tibialis, with no machine for it? Just look up tibialis exercise. It's pretty simple, actually. Um, there's there's a device you can get that you hook to your shin. Um, yeah, I mean, you kind of could do it with a with a dumbbell or even a kettlebell. I, mean, I guess you could do it with a kettlebell. Um, you know, you, but you probably have to get creative. Um, here, I mean, here's a good way. I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of resistance bands, but you could you could use a resistance band and do it. But you'd want to do a time static contraction. So if you want to train your tibialis, this is actually not a terrible way. Um, but you'd want to hold the contraction for a period of time un, until you generate significant fatigue. So that's a, that's how I would do it. I wouldn't do it with a dumbbell or a kettlebell. It's too wobbly. This this way would be fine. Um, but there is a machine. Like, this is a very dumb way. I wouldn't do it this way. Um, there is a exercise machine. There is a... Yeah. There's this. Tippy Alice Trainer. You could use this. Or a resistance band. Doesn't really matter. How would you go about increasing hip rotation speed and torque for boxing punches with hit? Practice punching. Okay. It, the rotation speed and, and your body torque is going to be dependent on what you're doing that rotation specifically for. You don't just train general hip rotation you you train the that hip rotation for that skill if you want to increase um you know your punching speed or your punching power you need to practice punching that's it you know the belief that you're going to take a particular joint movement and isolate it by itself outside of the skill you're going to be using it for and it's going to increase the skill you're going to be using it for is wrong. And you see a lot of people doing this hip rotation stuff, you know, with, with the cable or whatever. Not going to make a difference. You need to practice punching and make the muscles associated with punching as strong as possible. Um, so what are the muscles associated with punching? Choose basic exercises in a stable environment to work the muscles directly associated with punching. So it's going to be your triceps, your shoulders, your chest, your obliques, your abdomen, your lower back, basic exercises. All of them would be found in the golden era. Um, just make your body as strong as possible. Practice punching. Stop focusing on increasing hip rotation speed and torque and whatever. The reason your hip rotation speed is not very good is because you're not very good at punching yet, right? Um, that comes from a combination of getting better at punching, strength, and genetics. Could be your nervous system. If you don't rotate your hips as fast as Manny Pacquiao, <laughs> it's a genetic thing. It really is. It's a skill and a genetic thing. So people are under the impression that, you know, um, my punching speed, I want to increase my punching speed as fast as fucking Floyd Mayweather or Manny Pacquiao or something. You got to remember there is a genetic to limit to how well you can do these things. Okay. You can't increase your hip rotation speed as much as you want. It's going to be dependent on how, how your nervous system works, how it functions, how efficient it is. Um, it's going to be dependent on your bodily proportions Lots of things. But the only thing you can really do is make your entire body as strong as possible. And in the muscles associated with rotating your hip and all that kind of stuff will get stronger. Practice skill boxing, punching. That's all. 
you know, rem- you know, remember, it's not always the most physically um, superior athlete that does the best. It's usually not. I like to use Tom Brady as an example. You know, when you get to, you know, at lower level sports, you know, amateur level, strength, speed, power, et cetera, make much more of a difference. Okay. But as you get into higher levels, they make far less of a difference. Skill, intelligence, wisdom of the game plays a way more important role than speed and power and all that stuff. Here's good. <laughs> My brother started working out with a friend going five times a week. Told him to do hip, but they want to go five times a week for max results. But if you ever ask them, like, well, where did you get that idea from? They probably heard it on YouTube, whatever, whatever. Um, and the best thing you could do is just, like, show them that paper I was going over. Well, believe it or not, it's nonsense. Yeah, if you are able to work out five times a week, you're not working out. You're just doing movement. Um, exercise can involve movement. doesn't even need movement. But that does not mean all movements exercise. All right, a couple minutes, a couple minutes. <laughs> this is completely true. I know. It's like I don't even want to read any research anymore. It's like most of exercise is common sense. If you understand basic physiology, um, and if you understand the physiology of how a muscle grows, you don't need all these studies and all this nonsense. Uh, all right, let's see. Should leg training be for higher reps in the set compared to upper body? Nope, not necessarily. I'm programming thoughts on programming squats and conventional deadlifts. Um, I, personally, I wouldn't do squats and a deadlift in the same workout because they load and work the same muscle group essentially. I wouldn't do it in the same workout. Um, I would alternate them between workouts. And no, legs do not need to be higher reps. A rep is meaningless. Whether or not the weight moves is actually relatively meaningless. It's the time under meaningful load that counts. Whether you get 60 seconds of time under meaningful load in four reps or eight reps, the results are exactly the same. So the reps don't matter. Um, but do you need a higher time under load for legs? No. A muscle is a muscle. Do you think training intensity is a learned trait? Is this something that anyone can start with? Or do you need base level of weight training experience? You don't need weight training experience to learn how to train intensely. You just need proper coaching. Some people um, learn how to do it very quickly, very easily. Some people need a lot of coaching um, in order to learn how to do it. It really depends. Some people, you know, they, they could just, I can just, they can watch a video of how to do a set to failure and then be able to do it right away. Some people need to be taught a little more. So I would say it's both. I just fractured my wrist. It's a moderate fracture. I follow your training system. I'm wondering how I should approach training after sustaining the injury. Um, well, first of all, wait till you're completely healed. Completely healed. You could do exercises that don't involve your wrist. Um, they're probably, well, there aren't really many. Continue to train your legs. I would continue to train your legs. Wait until you are completely healed. And um, as long as you're completely healed, if you're moving relatively slow with your training, um, you should be just fine. You know, maybe start a little lighter. Do a little lighter weight, longer sets to failure in the beginning because the additional weight could provide additional sharing force that might cause injury, but, you know. Um, <laughs> but um, just start slow. Just take your time. Lighter weight, longer set duration, you know, slow. Yeah. 
Is hit good for metabolism increase? Well, you need to understand what metabolism increase means. We're talking about metabolic efficiency. Um, demanding stress on your muscles will stimulate an increase in metabolic efficiency, no matter how you do it. High intensity training places a very high stress on your muscles and the metabolism of your muscles resulting in a very high stimulus for an increase in metabolic efficiency. So high intensity training is the best way to increase metabolic efficiency, hands down. Do drills with resistance bands help in boxing? Absolutely fucking not. Bullshit. You want to get better at boxing? Box people. All right, a couple more, a couple more. Egyptian Leo raises, don't know what that means. Do you recommend working out once a week for women for weight loss, same way as men? Yes, weight loss doesn't come from exercise. Weight loss is a very small part of exercise, or exercise is a very small part of weight loss. Weight loss comes from a negative energy balance, which comes from your diet. The purpose of exercise during weight loss is to add lean muscle tissue, or at least preserve it, as you mobilize fat during your diet. Exercise does not burn significant amounts of fat. You were lied to by companies trying to sell you bullshit. It is a lie. There is no literature, and in fact, many re much recent literature that shows that not only does exercise burn very few additional calories, your body adapts in such a way to where eventually you burn no additional calories through physical activity. Exercise does not burn fat. Calorie restriction burns fat. Exercise builds usable muscle tissue or at least preserves it as your fat is lost to calorie restriction. One of the biggest lies people have been sold is that exercise burns fat. It does not. <laughs> it burns glycogen. All right, one more. One more. Should concentric tempo be faster than each centric since it's a weaker contraction? No. No. The, the tempo doesn't matter. Just keep it slow. All right. I like my tempo varies between exercises. Could be a 5-5. Five, five, could be an 8-8. Eight, eight. Doesn't matter. Just go slow. Tempo or rep cadence makes no difference on muscle growth. None. Um, the purpose of going slower is to reduce shearing forces because high shearing forces create cumulative wear and tear and cumulative damage on your connective tissue over time, which will likely lead to an injury over time. So if we go slower, we reduce shearing forces, we reduce or essentially eliminate the accumulation of the damage on your connective tissues so you don't get hurt in the long run. The tempo has nothing to do with the muscle growth. The intensity has everything to do with the muscle growth. If you went extremely slow, but you didn't train very hard, you wouldn't stimulate shit. If you went really, really fast, but you trained really hard, you would stimulate muscle growth very well, but you'd, you'd sustain an injury in the process. So that's the purpose of going slow. All right. All right, guys, that's it for me. Um, Home workout and arm program are free with Golden Air today. Try it. It will be the best system you've ever used. Um, and just follow that system along with the other recommendations I give on YouTube. 
because in these live streams, I go very, very deep into detail with a lot of things. Um, the Golden Air system shows you what to do, exactly what to do. But if you want to go deeper into detail, you're going to want to attend these live streams, which I do that. Um, okay, one more, because I have to address this. I've been doing your method for a few weeks, and now I don't feel extremely sore after the workouts. Is this right? Yes, it is right. You shouldn't feel sore after you do the workout a couple times. Soreness is just your pain receptor's response to muscle damage. When you continue to do the same exercises over a period of a couple of weeks, the pain receptors get less sensitive to the muscle damage of those exercises and the soreness goes away. Soreness is supposed to go away. Soreness can be a side effect of uh, muscle damage with a particular activity, but soreness does not indicate an effective workout. Okay. Yes, you should stop getting sore almost completely. A lot of people out there try to change up their workouts because they think soreness means they had an effective workout, but it doesn't. So what people end up doing is doing different workouts all the time because new movements will produce soreness under the wrong belief that soreness means an effective workout. So yes, you should stop feeling sore. But again, some people will still get sore. Why? The genetics. You know, your pain receptors. Some people have more sensitive pain receptors. Some people are more sensitive to muscle damage. Some people are not sensitive at all. Depends. But soreness is not necessary for an effective workout. If you do this workout, you will very likely get sore the first couple of times, and then it'll go away completely. And it should. All right? All right, guys, remember, like, subscribe, hit the bell. So you're going to be notified when I do more live streams. Um, and I will see you guys in a couple of days. I got more um, shorts coming out with Dorian Yates. And if you haven't, watch my interview with Dorian Yates. It's a good one. And also the interview with Steve Maxwell if you're interested in how to apply um, high-intensity training with martial arts. All right, guys. See you later.